My name is Isabel War. I'm the manager of academic programs and outreach at GDC Archives. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar in the context of the Ruth and David Musher um, GDC Archives Fellowship Program. I would like first to say a few words about um, GDC Archives. Um, GDC Archives um, holds the records of GDC since its creation about 106 years ago. As, as such, it is one of the most important repositories for the study of modern Jewish history. Uh, scholars from around the world, as well as um, journalists, family researchers, filmmakers, um, use our collections for their research. Uh, we also offer fellowships. Um, one of these fellowships is the Ruth and David Musher um, GDC Archives Fellowship which was established thanks to a generous gift from Ruth and David Musher. Ruth um, and David Musher are supporters of GDC. Um, they also have um, a long time commitment to Jewish education and um, scholarly research um, and um, academic research. Um, this is our Six Ruth and David Musher JDC Archives Public Program, and uh, I want to extend our thanks to Ruth and David Musher who are with us today for um, their generosity in undergoing this fellowship. Um, our speaker today, Dora Petoritsa, is the recipient um, of the 2020 Ruth and David Musher um, JDC Archives Fellowship. Um, the format is that she will give a lecture for about 45 minutes. This will be followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. And um, please note that your microphones are turned off. Um, questions can be sent through the Q&A function. You can send your questions at any time um, during the lecture. And uh, Ruth Musher will now introduce um, Dora Pateritza. Thank you. Dr. Dora Pacharitza has a PhD in philology from Debrecen University in Hungary and currently is a postdoctoral research fellow in history at Obo Academy University in Finland, where she is working on the project Boundaries of Jewish Identities in Contemporary Finland. Dr. Pacharitza is also directing a project in Hungary in the Zeged Jewish community, reconstructing the fate of Hungarian and Betka Serbian victims of the Holocaust. This project initiated by Dr. Petrica, whose maternal grandmother was born in Zeged and funded by the Claims Conference is the subject of several articles and a manuscript in English soon to be published. Dr. Pacharitza is the recipient of the 2020 Ruth and David Musher JDC Archives Fellowship. Her research in the archives augments her research and personal experience in the Zeged Jewish community. It is an unusual story and an unusual window into past events and fascinating. And now Dr. Pacharitza will begin her talk. Please give back my nightstand lamp for joint activity in the Zeged in Zeged in the aftermath of the Holocaust. Dear Ruth and David, thanks a lot for this opportunity for me to speak today. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure. Um, and I'm also happy that we still got an opportunity to meet in good old times in Warsaw in 2009. Uh, 19 in the JDC conference. Today I'm going to talk about the era uh, right after the Holocaust and what happened in Seged, partly, partly through my own family's history. In a way, I have started this research already 25 years ago, when at the age of 14, uh, that was the first time when uh, I had to do a history assignment and my father told me in detail about his family in Seged. And I remember deciding that I'm going to find out as much as possible about them and also 
uh, I'll try to locate our lost relatives. Let me share my slides with you. It all started with an art archival project at the Seged Jewish community in 2018 and 19, the aim of which was the preservation and the accessibility of the scattered documentation of the Seged Jewish community's archive. We have cataloged, indexed, and digitized almost all of the documents of the Seged Jewish community. The documents related to Holocaust in Seged, approximately four meters of documents, had already been cataloged and indexed and digitized on microfilms by King of Raimovich and Judith Molnar earlier. Uh, the, the, the archive has a wide range of documents, all kinds of records. The most important, of course, uh, are the vital registers, but it also has school records, burial records, board minutes, all kinds of requests, correspondences, even the architectural plans of the synagogue. And beside it also has music scores, all kinds of photos, and even paintings. On the picture, you can see my colleague, Jolt Urbanchok, the chief archivist of the Chongrad County Archive. My current research started with this little piece of paper written by my grandmother's grandmother in 1945 in August. And it says that she would like to get back the nightstand lamp that she had taken with herself to the ghetto uh, still back in 1944. Um, and she got it back. That, that's the end of this story. But I had several questions. First of all, she was 66 years old. So how does it come that she could survive the Holocaust at all? And then my second question is, why on earth would she want the nightstand lamp? Why is it a nightstand lamp that was most important to her in August 1945? Here you can see a picture of my grandmother's grandmother. Uh, Mrs. Wilmos Fuchs. By 1945, she had been a widow for three years. Um, her husband, my grandmother's grandfather, was the head of the Jewish elementary school for uh, over 30 years. He was also the Hazan of the synagogue and the secretary of the burial society, the Hevra Kadisha. Um, my grandmother's grandmother was born in Ershekuivar, which was Upper Hungary back then. Nowadays, it belongs to Slovakia. And this piece of information, the information that she was born in Upper Hungary had a, an important effect to my uh, family's history that I'm going to expand on later. So today I would like to present you the history of the Jewry of Seged and the history of Seged's Jewry during the Holocaust. Also, what kinds of records do we have? And then the focus of my lecture is uh, on the activity of joint in Seged right after the Holocaust, then in 1948 and also in 1989. And finally, I'm going to talk about JDC's aid to my other family members. So first of all, Hungary is in Central Europe. You can see it here. And uh, Szeged is in Southeastern Hungary, uh, very close to both the Serbian and the Romanian border. It lies on the two banks of the river Tisza. And it's mostly a center of uh, food industry. So if you are familiar with either the pig salami or paprika from from Seged, maybe those are the most important products of Seged. The Seged, Seged jewelry is special from many aspects. First of all, Seged was the focal point of Neolog Judaism. Neolog Judaism is a special denomination in Hungarian Jew, Jewry. It's a progressive um, branch of Judaism, which started at the same time as the Reform Judaism in Germany, but it's a much more conservative denomination. 
Anyway, uh, it developed in Szeged thanks to the two Löw rabbis, uh, uh, Löw Lipot, the father, and his son, Löw Emanuel, uh, served as rabbis for almost 100 years in Szeged, and it was them partly uh, developing this whole concept of neolog Judaism. After the Treaty of Trianon in 1920, when Hungary lost two thirds of its area, the Kolozsvár University, which until then, until then was in Transylvania, but it got part of Romania. So the Kolozsvár University moved to Szeged and Szeged thus became a university city. And this loss in territories also meant a huge range of immigration. And thus the Jews of Szeged made a significant contribution to all kinds of uh, fields, science, culture, finance, architecture, industry, and uh, Szeged transformed from an agrarian city into a scientific and cultural center. An excellent example of this is that of the Pick Salami uh, and the Pick family. Mark Pick was already born in the middle of the 19th century in Szeged. He was a Jew who realized that the natural endowment of Szeged uh, is ideal to create the perfect salami. Of course, that salami was made of pork. And he became a very successful businessman he exported tons of salamis also abroad. Uh, he developed the perfect salami right there in Szeged. But since he had a very strong Jewish identity, at least according to oral history by his granddaughter, Vera Pick, uh, he never ever tasted his own product because he could be a successful businessman and also uh, a strong, someone with a strong Jewish identity. The biggest achievement of Szeged's Jewry is without doubt um, the synagogue, the new synagogue of Szeged. It's Europe's fourth biggest synagogue and the second biggest uh, synagogue in Hungary. The first is uh, the one in Dohány utca, Budapest, uh, which is almost the same size as the one in New York. This synagogue was finished by May 1903 and it was designed, uh, co-designed by Lipold Baumhorn, who was the most uh, successful and prolific uh, synagogue architect of his time. And he co-designed it with Chief Rabbi Emanuel Löw. And um, this is the result. I'll show you a video since unfortunately nowadays you cannot travel to Szeged. This synagogue was reconstructed uh, from the outside a couple of years ago, but it still needs to be uh, restored from the inside. Unfortunately, that's millions of dollars. So we are looking forward to it because it's in a bad shape from the inside. Now I'm coming to the research uh, and the current research. I have used uh, sources that are scattered all over the world. And shortly, I'd like to talk about these. The most important source of course, sources are, of course, at the JDC archive in New York, but I have also used sources from the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, and Los Angeles didn't fit on that map, but they have excellent oral testimonies. In the middle of Germany, uh, you can see the, the Arolsen archive, and it's not by accident right in the middle of uh, Germany, because towards the end of the war, uh, all the documents what survived 
uh, on Nazi persecution were taken to the middle of Germany because the war situation was relatively mild right there. So they also have a lot of also personal information on, on the victims. In Hungary, I have used in Budapest, the Hungarian Jewish Museum and Archives documents, and also digitized newspapers by Arkanum and Hungarikana. And then in Seged, I have used the Seged Jewish Archives, of course, and also the Chongrad County Archive. And finally, in Israel, I have used the Yad Vashem Archives. I would like to say a very short introduction to Hungarian to the Hungarian Holocaust. After the German occupation in March uh, 1944, in only a couple of weeks, in three months, altogether 440,000 Hungarian Jews were deported to Auschwitz. Most of them were deported to Auschwitz and uh, this happened with a very active cooperation and collaboration of the Hungarian population and the Hungarian officials. Uh, the majority of them were murdered immediately and in Auschwitz there are hardly any records on them. 15,000 Hungarian Jews ended up in Strasshof near Vienna. This was a concentration camp and a labor camp, but not a death camp. And also children and elderly were among these. Uh, this was a deal, so-called blood for goods between SS Obersturmbahnführer Eichmann and the Rescue and Relief Zionist Committee represented by Dr. Rezil Kostner, a lawyer from Kolozsvár. Uh, the survivor rate between these two groups are significantly different, uh, whereas those uh, who were transported to Auschwitz, approximately 20% of them survived. Those who ended up in Strasshof, 75% of them survived. When it came to the deportation of the Seged Jews in, in late June 1944, the beige color depicts the situation at that time. So by then already the D-Day has taken place and you can see that the, that the Russian, uh, the Red Army was already at what was the border of Hungary back then. So this is what the, what the situation was like in in uh, June 1944, yet the Hungarian jury was deported. Here you can see two pictures. Um, the left-hand side picture was uh, made by Béla Liebmann and it's the border of the ghetto with a high fence made of wooden planks. In the background, you can see the headquarter of the Jewish community of Szeged and on the right hand side, you can say, see the same scene. It is still used as the headquarter of the Seged Jewish community. In this ghetto, uh, 3,800 Jews were squeezed in and also 500 Christians of Jewish origin, they were located at another place. Four to five families had to, same, uh, had to share the same apartment and then uh, the ghetto had to be closed down on 16th of June and they were uh, transported to the brick factory of Seged after an extensive body search. One of our most important sources for this is the ghettoization list from the Seged Jewish Archive. Here you can see the family names and the first names, even doctoral titles and family statuses such as widow the place of birth, the year of birth, occupations, and the addresses, of course, before the ghettoization. You can see also these pencil marks, for example, this tick mark means that they have survived the war, whereas the line means that they haven't survived. And here magnified, I can show you the record of my grandmother's grandmother and her daughter. Uh, saying that she was born in Ersekuivar in 1879. Both of them survived. Uh, my grandmother's grandmother's occupation was a housewife and her daughter was a photographer. The majority uh, of the people on the list are women and also elderly and children, since men at that time were already in the military forced labor 
Again, pictures by Béla Liebman, photographer from Szeged, and also a typewritten postcard um, written by Eva Adler, a Jewish woman from Szeged to her husband, Janos Adler. This is part of the Adler collection, which is currently stored at the Holocaust Memorial Museum. And that was written in 1943, when the husband was already in forced labor. When it came to the ghettoization and then uh, the stay at the transit ghetto, there was no mercy at all. Chief Rabbi Immanuel Löw used to be a member of the upper house of the Hungarian parliament. He also hold an honorary doctorate from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, the Jewish Theological Seminary and the Hebrew Union College in New York. Uh, he was invited several times to be the chief rabbi in Vienna and London, but he always refused because he wanted to stay in Seged. Yet he too uh, had to stay in the ghetto and he too was taken to the brick factory. It was rainy, he had to lie on the ground and that's where he contracted um, a bilateral pneumonia. He was already over the age of 90. And even though he was taken off, uh, off the train in Budapest, he, his life couldn't be saved anymore. But also babies were taken to the ghetto. This uh, oral testimony by Ilona Müller, a former uh, member of the Szeged Jewish community, uh, tells us how the police superintendent ordered her to take a newborn baby. Uh, the parents hoped that they would forget about her but uh, the, the superintendent knew exactly that this baby too has to be taken to the ghetto. And so they did. Uh, you might want to know that this very baby survived the war, uh, the war and she's still alive. The Hungarian Jewish Museum and Archive has a collection of these report cards uh, of Jewish communities in the countryside of Hungary. They uh, list all the events and decisions that were made. For example, on the left-hand side, it says that no more packages can be taken to the ghetto and personal meetings are not possible anymore after a certain date. On the right-hand side, it says exactly which houses are used uh, for, to, for the ghettoization. And then it came to the depor deportations in June, 1944. Uh, there were three trains uh, deporting a total of 8,500 people, not only Jews from Seged, but also from the surrounding villages. The first one ended up in Auschwitz and almost everyone was killed. The second one was, um, it seems that there was a misunderstanding. So it was decoupled and the first part of it went to Auschwitz. Again, almost everyone was killed. Whereas the second part of it ended up in Strasshof near Vienna. And the third one, it seems that it was deliberately sent to Strasshof. What was the criteria for selection? How did they decide who gets on which train? And uh, who were these people? Uh, we have a project funded by the Claims Conference in which we try to reconstruct those, the names of those 8,500 people who were on these trains. And also we try to find out who was on which train. We use a wide variety of sources to achieve this. And we also have to adapt new research techniques from digital history to advance the research. We have to merge databases, solve different kinds of contradictions. And while I was preparing this lecture, we got the news from International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance that we had a successful application which means that we are going to be able to make a so-called digital memorial wall with the names of all of these victims. And this is a collaboration with the Novica Jewish community. I have already mentioned a couple of times Bela Liebman, a photographer. He was the first photo reporter of Szeged. Here you can see his shop. And he decided at a young age that he's never going to marry. But when he first got to see his wife, Serena Hortobagi, at the banks of the uh, river Tisza in a bathing suit, a young, young girl in the early 1930s, he, met, he immediately forgot about his decision. 
he married her, they had a happy life, they had a child together. And I'm telling you uh, in detail the story of Bela Liebman's family because in a way it's, um, it's even, it can even be said to be typical. So Bela was in forced labor and um, his wife and daughter ended up in, a, in the transport to Strasbourg. In April 1945, both of them were already liberated and on the way back home when uh, they met an SS division who killed them on the spot. And uh, this is how Bela Liebman uh, lost his family. He arrived back to Seged in the beginning of 1945 and he took pictures also of the synagogue, which was used as a deposit for Jewish goods. Here you can see pictures uh, inside the synagogue with all kinds of furniture. And this is the ceremonial hall of the Jewish community center with 10,000 pairs of shoes. The question might arise, how does it come that these things survived the war? right there. And the, the answer lies in two factors. First of all, Seged was relatively mildly bombed, if I may say it. So here you can see a picture of the dome of the Seged synagogue. And you can see that nearby there was a hit of a bomb, but the Seged synagogue was not hit. And they haven't bombed uh, strongly uh, Seged because it didn't have any important factories. So it stayed intact. And then the second reason is that Seged was one of the first cities to be liberated in Hungary already in October, 1944. And this also meant that the Arrow Cross Party could not rule in Seged, uh, who started uh, ruling in other parts of the country on the 16th of October. Um, and there is oral history, I didn't find proof for it, that the Russian city commander of Seged was a Russian Jew and he did not allow the synagogue to be plundered. This is extremely exceptional. We know for sure that JDC had a strong cooperation with these uh, representatives of the Red Army. This is a picture of Russian soldiers in Seged. Here you can see a Again, a, Rus a Russian soldier in front of one of the gates of the synagogue. And uh, proofs of this cooperation are uh, the double language uh, letter writing paper and also the stamp saying um, uh, International Red Cross and American Joint Distribution Committee also in Russian, in Cyrillic letters. Joint in Hungarian, JDC is uh, consequently called Joint, American Joint Distribution Committee. So Joint was already active in Hungary before the war, but once uh, the USA and Hungary got into a war state, they, they were expelled from Hungary. As I said, since Szeged was one of the first cities to be liberated, they have restarted their operation in liberated Szeged and also established a, an office in Szeged. There was even a time when there was the ghetto in Budapest still was standing and uh, they distributed food there that had been prepared in Seged since in Seged already the conditions were relatively good. And then it came to the return of the survivors. Uh, in the background, you can see a letter in which the National Organization of the Hungarian Deportees informed the Szeged Jewish community that there are many deportees from Vienna that have survived. And this is the first time that they have heard that about this fact. Approximately 50% of the Szeged deportees return, return to Szeged. You can see here an, a document entitling to the journey back. Uh, here it says Szeged, and this is a document of Borbála Adler. And uh, again, I'd like to emphasize that the situation in Szeged is exceptional, and that was not typical at all. Szeged was liberated much earlier than other Hungarian cities, and there were much more survivors than anywhere else. There were also children, 
even babies, elderly and families among the survivors. And also much of their belongings remained intact. Yet 50% of the community perished. Their apartments were occupied by strangers. Their furniture more or less survived. But the fact that their furniture was given back does not mean that, for example, their valuables such as paintings were give, ever given back or factories as in the case of the family of the pigs. And they were in a very bad physical and mental health. Here you can see a report card of the survivors. That's a document in the Seged Jewish Archive. And it, uh, it's that of my grandmother's grandmother saying that she returned from Theresienstadt together with her daughter aged 35. And this one also says that she received a cash aid from joint, I have highlighted it. And she also received flour, um, a household package and a third kind of aid that I could simply not read out. We have 1,600 of these report cards in the Seged Jewish archive. And there is also another list of survivors that start at the Arosen archive. And here you can see part of it. It says fish, which is obviously a typo. And uh, I would like to show you the ghettoization list and you can spot the differences. So first of all, fish is a typo, whereas fuchs is of course the correct way to write it. Here it says that she was born in 1909, which is the correct information. Here it says 1910. And here um, the occupation is uh, officer, whereas here she's um, said to be a photographer. And it's exactly because of these controversies that we have to use the most uh, modern uh, IT technology to, to uh, reconcile these uh, controversies. Joint had several missions. The most important were ones for repatriation, uh, the basic needs, and uh, providing a permanent aid to those who needed it. On the right hand side, you can see an, an article saying that Joint is taking care of the return of, um, of the deportees. And it even says that they take care that 11 orphans from uh, most probably from Strasshof also can return back to Budapest and they know their identity. These are the requests of the returnees in the Seged Jewish Archive, uh, three boxes with approximately 4,000 requests and we have indexed every single piece of these. As I have already said, Joint has had several uh, tasks in Seged. For example, in this one, someone is asking for a cash aid, but from Joint. This is a correspondence between the Joint Hospital in Seged. They were asking for various items from the Seged Jewish community. And as you can see, it's very basic items. And they, they also kept track of those items that belong to Jews, but ended up at non-Jews so that if these were needed, they could be returned. This is a heart-wrenching request by Josef Fényes, a university student, saying that he's appeared in that one set of clothes and he would like to ask for a medical apron so that he can protect that one single cloth that he has. He also asked for an umbrella uh, for the same reason, uh, and I have checked and his uh, parents indeed disappeared. I have already mentioned the joint hospital. It was run by joint and they too were asking all kinds of items from the second Jewish community. Uh, and the second Jewish community at one point had to answer that they, they know, of course, that these are very important items that they are requesting, but they don't have an abundance of these. So at that time, they could only, only provide 25% of the requested um, quantity. On the left hand side, you can see a list of all kinds of medicines that were given from the second Jewish community to the joint hospital. Um, here you can see Dr. Istvan Shalamon, a family doctor from Seged who was active until a month ago. 
He's uh, 81 years old now and a survivor. He was deported from Seged at the age of four and returned to Seged at the age of five. And he has fond memories of JDC and how, received, how he received chocolate from JDC at the age of five. I tried to check and I'm pretty sure that he received Hershey's chocolates based on this photograph from the JDC archive. And I have even checked uh, at that time, this is what the package, package uh, of the Hershey's chocolate looked like. He also has memories of receiving tinned peaches, but uh, I uh, haven't found any written traces on that. A slide on the extent of joints help. So in only nine months uh, between March uh, and December 1945, they have distributed 1 million Swiss francs. They had 26 expeditions to get the deputies home. Uh, and they have spent, so JDC spent altogether $52 million in Hungary. And on today's value, this would be $700 million. On the right hand side, the article says that joint has helped um, 180 Jews and also several non Jews. In 1946, they have uh, distributed 26,000 Swiss francs. They fed people in canteens, they have provided medical aids, they were generally taking care of people, several people got, got clothes, and they even gave uh, support for 180 agricultural and industrial factories. I also found an article on the extent of joint aid specifically in Seged. So joint uh, donated money to returning prisoner of wars. They also donated money to the national aid and non-Jewish institution. 2,000 people received regularly aid, uh, also university students. And uh, the, re the Jewish returnees received uh, a one-time cash aid, and then they could choose whether they want to have a certain amount of money, or they would receive daily menus three times a week. Also, anyone traveling through Seged would get money and also meals. They ran two canteens where 750 people were fed every single day. As I said, there was also the uh, joint hospital where people received treatment and medication for free. And this very article lists a few examples of what kind of items uh, people received as an aid from Jade, JDC, such as glasses, dentures, instep razors, hernia dresses, and even laundry service, very everyday objects, but these could really um, elevate the quality of life of someone. JDC's uh, help or aid was of such an extent that it even created jealousy among uh, the non-Jewish population. So this article from 1946 says uh, that uh, uh, there was tension uh, in Solnok and other Hungarian city because in joint, uh, the Jews would recite, uh, receive two bowls of meals, whereas the non-Jewish uh, a charity would only hand out one bowl of meal. JDC was still present in Seged in 1948, and I found three reports. The first one is a report on the numbers and the population uh, of Jews in Seged, 3,000 Jews, um, number of families and employees. The second uh, had to report on the nationalization of the Seged Jewish Elementary School. This is where my grandmother's grandfather used to be the director. And in 1948, they had to close down the school. Um, and JDC even took care, I have already mentioned the 
hemp production factory in Szeged. So they even made sure uh, that the factory would have the necessary needles. It says that they cannot be obtained locally. So these were ordered from abroad. I found one case in which it was not specifically JDC helping uh, the Jewry of Seged, but a Jew from Seged helping JDC. Professor Jenő Kramer was a professor of pediatrics in Seged. And according to this document, he uh, gave trainings to uh, physicians uh, after the war. He must have been a representative of uh, Jewish uh, intelligentsia in uh, Szeged, and he could use his knowledge to help people. Uh, the operation of joint was not really possible after 1950, uh, and I didn't find any documents either. And then finally in 1953, uh, joint again was expelled from Hungary. As soon as it was possible again to, uh, to be present in Hungary, JDC again was present. The Szeged synagogue um, was inaugurated again in 1989 with a generous donation from one of the Seged Jewish, uh, from, with a member of the Seged Jewish community who ended up in the US. But as you can see, also the JDC contributed with a, um, with a generous amount. And you can also see an article on this inauguration by Ruth Ellen Gruber, uh, the current director of Jewish Heritage Europe, and a photo uh, by Edward Serota of this re-auguration uh, event. The aim of JDC was to restart Jewish life in Hungary in generally, but also in Szeged, and to reinforce the Jewish identity uh, of those who remained in Szeged after a break of uh, almost 45 years. I'm getting back to my grandmother's grandmother. She survived the war together with her daughter, Borbala, the photographer. Uh, in 1945, in August, when she wrote that piece of paper, I'm pretty sure that she hasn't heard for, uh, of her two children uh, who made Aliyah before the war, Eva on the left-hand side, who made Aliyah in, together with her um, Jewish husband, also from Szeged. They made Aliyah in 1939 and they were uh, evaded by Eva's brother, Miksha. Unfortunately, I don't have a photo of him. So two of her children were in uh, the mandate of Palestine. For various reasons, she did not have contact to my great grandmother, whom you can see on the right hand side. And I said that the fact that she was born in Upper Hungary, also her husband was born in Upper Hungary, is important in this story because Szeged was not a Zionist center at all, but Upper Hungary the Zionist movement in Upper Hungary was really strong. So it's due to the family connections uh, and also the holidays that the children used to spend in Upper Hungary, where they met uh, this whole Zionist concept. And this is how uh, they made, or at least two of the six children made Aliyah. Other members of the family, I have already mentioned uh, my grandmother's grandfather, uh, Vilmos, who died in 1942. So that, of course, was also a loss. Um, the oldest daughter, Vilma, uh, committed suicide uh, after the war in April 1945. And it says that she died due to morphine uh, poisoning. And I cannot think of another reason than a rape by Russian soldiers. Why would she have died uh, in April 1945? Her younger son uh, died in forced labor service in 1942. And then she had three grandchildren, Andras, after whom my father was named, 
was killed on his 17th birthday in February 1945 in forced labor. My grandmother survived the war, but she was in hiding and heavily tra traumatized. She never ever spoke about this. And then her youngest granddaughter, uh, the daughter of her youngest uh, daughter, Eva, she must have been at exactly at this age in uh, 1945, a five-year-old. Uh, Therese, of, of course, has not seen her uh, until then. She did not have a chance to see her. So to get back to the lamp, uh, we don't really know why she needed that lamp. We know for sure that she received an aid from JDC. She received a cash aid. Uh, I'm sure she got medical help. She got uh, food, meals, uh, but there are certain things that cannot be replaced. This scattered family, all these family losses, it's not something that can be taken care of with money. And I, if, well, I'm a historian, I don't really make guesses, but I assume that that very nice stand lamp must have meant a lot to her. It must have symbolized the pre-war life uh, when everything was still rather okay in her life. So I guess that's why it had a huge emotional uh, importance to her. JDC did not only help in Seged, but also in another city. And at this point, I dare to say that my husband and thus my children would not exist if it wasn't for JDC. Piroshka Moskovich uh, was a survivor of Auschwitz. She lost both her parents, three of her siblings. When at the age of 19, JDC sent her to Hajdu Soboslo, a city in the east of Hungary, to spend a couple of weeks in a spa and regain health. And that's where she was spotted by another survivor, a survivor of forced labor, Imre Levi, who decided to uh, marry her. They had three children together, six grandchildren. One of them is my uh, father, uh, my husband. Uh, recently, we lost uh, Piroshka, but up until her death, she used to recall the story and the aid of JDC that she received. Uh, otherwise, she would have made Aliyah, and of course, we have no idea what would have happened, but uh, this way she stayed in Hungary, thanks to JDC. And JDC is still present in our lives. We are sending our kids, our two oldest kids, to, to the JDC camp in Sarvas. And here you can see pictures of my oldest son's bar mitzvah in the Sarvas camp in 2018. That's something that they would wait for 350 days a year to finally go to uh, Sarvas. Here you can also see my daughter. And it's the JDC camp in Hungary that can give them a strong Hungarian Jewish identity. When I was at this age, sitting next to my great-grandmother, she had no clue that I would grow up become a historian, acquire all kinds of methodolog methodological and uh, research skills and tools that would enable me to discover and reconstruct her story, that of her family, and also that of her community, and that I would spend years of my life to reconstruct and to find out what has happened in Seged before and after the war. I would even become officially a member uh, of the Seged Jewish community uh, in her community. Uh, but as there are less and less survivors, it's more and more our duty and responsibility to make sure that these stories do not get forgotten. Thanks a lot. Dora, I think you have to stop sharing your slide. Yes, great. This was a fascinating lecture. Um, Dora, we now open um, 
the I have a few I have a few questions of my own, but uh, I think we'll now first open the floor um, to questions and just a reminder that your microphones are turned off and please send your question via um, the Q and A um, option. Um, so Dora, the first questions are the first question has to do with um, the size of the population of the Jewish population in Hungary today and uh, and also of the Jewish population in Seged um, today. So if you, I don't know if you have those numbers in, on top of your head, but um, a few people would like to know. Uh, the po Jewish population of Hungary is an estimated 50 to 100,000 people. And I think no one really knows the exact number. It's also a question of the defi definition is who is considered a Jew. So we only have estimations and the Jewish population in Seged is not easy either. As far as I know, uh, there are approximately 300 members in the community, there, but there must be much more Jews in the city. It might be that there are even Jews who don't know about their origin. And I'm sure that there are uh, Jews who know that they are Jews, but they are not members of the community. But there are 300, approximately 300 registered members. And um, I'm going to follow up on this because I, I see that we have a, a few more questions uh, around around that theme. Um, someone is ask uh, who are the most active members um, of of the Jewish community in Zagreb. I don't know if um, if you would know that. Uh, I mean, it's all kinds of people. Part of the people who remain there, and also people who moved to Zagreb from other cities. Uh, and even converted people. And uh, is the synagogue used now? Yes, the synagogue is used. It's, uh, the video was really nice, but uh, in the inside, it looks, at some points, it looks terrible. And it can be only used in the summertime, which has always been the case because it's so huge that it cannot be heated. But in the summertime, it's used actively and it belongs to the Seged Jewish community, unlike the old synagogue, which was sold to the city because they couldn't uh, maintain it in the 70s, in the 1970s. And uh, you said that there are about 300 Jews today in Seged? Yes. yes. Um, and are people there staying? Are they living? Um... I mean, is there is there a trend? Uh, well, the trend in Hungary is that a lot of people are leaving. I'm not sure about Seged because I'm not enough familiar with this topic. I think Seged is one of the really uh, nice cities. So, but I, I could only make guesses uh, if there is emigration of the Jewish population of Seged. I don't think that this would exist in Seged, but emigration from Hungary is an existing phenomenon. Right. Also Jews, um, by Jews. Thank you, Dora. Um, okay, so we, we have a, a, quite a bit more questions. Um, another question is, do you know what happened to um, Seged Jewish gold um, that, that you mentioned? S sorry, the Seged Jewish? The, the gold, the Jewish gold that you, you mentioned in your presentation. You mean the paintings and the valuables? Maybe that's... Uh, I believe this is um, th this is what um, it must be about. Yes, um, the paintings were never ever returned. So, yes, they. We also have list long lists of paintings that belong to the Seged Jewry, and they were not returned. Yes. Um, the the next question has to do um, with with your research uh, itself. Uh, how do you reconcile the discrepancies in the different documents and archives? Um, why do you think so many mistakes happen on just one page? Um, and and, well, and then I will go to the next question because it's not such, it, it's, it's on a different theme. It's by okay. the same person, but it's a bit different. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I simply think that the uh, circumstances under which these documents were written were everything but ideal. So they had to write again and again long lists. They had a short time. Might be that they didn't even have electricity. So, um, and it was right in the middle of war. Uh, 
maybe they haven't used their registers or part of it was written on on wrong documents or, or already existing wrong databases. Uh, I can only make guesses. And how we try to reconcile it, we clean this data. And uh, for example, I'm using the software uh, OpenRefine, which can, which might be able to spot typos. And uh, it's a rather smart software that can be also used to merge data. But part of this, of course, has to be made manually. So I, when it comes to, for example, uh, uh, an occupation, in the end, it's going to be me deciding which one to accept. And very often, I'm just putting there both because I cannot know which one, uh, which one is correct. Um, and there is also, of course, this timestamp that someone might have three different uh, occupations. So part of it is done manually, and then part of it is done with, uh, with all kinds of softwares and IT tools. Um the, the, there's another question about um, the, the survivor of the Jewish community of um, Saged. Um, how come so many more families and properties from Saged have survived? Um, do you think the local Saged neighbors and local Hungarians behave differently during World War II? No, definitely not, because we also have the request, and I haven't showed it in my uh, presentation simply because we didn't have enough time. The Saged uh, Seged's non-Jewish population made already requests before the Seged Jewish population was deported. And already then they said that, okay, I want this flat because it has three nice bedrooms and it has a huge piano and my daughter is playing the piano. So no, unfortunately, I cannot say that Seged's population was any better than in other parts of the, uh, of the country. I think, uh, it remained intact because there was a relatively short period. So somehow they made sure that the synagogue with all these items was not plundered between the end of June and the middle of October. Um, and um, how, how were the refugees uh, when they returned after the war? Um, how did the local population treat them? Uh, I have not really found information on that. So, uh, and of course, I don't want to make guesses because it's not about guesses. Uh, I, I simply, I didn't find any sources on them and I haven't really dug into this. Also, I mean, I can see that my grandmother's grandmother returned to her apartment that used to belong to her before the war, but uh, I can imagine that it, it simply belonged to the community since her husband had important functions in the community. And then it simply means that the community returned its own apartment to her. I mean, you did mention the tensions between um, the Jews and the non-Jews after the war because the Jews were receiving um, more, more assistance uh, from, from the GDC. Um, and, and I'm just curious, did you, did you find this in in uh, oral testimony? Did people mention it in oral testimonies or was it in letters? Um, I have not come across this specifically in Seged. And I, I would say that the situation was maybe not as bad as in Poland, but there was tension in Hungary, definitely. Maybe not in Seged, but in other cities. Yes, there were even pogroms. Uh, not it wasn't common, and I think it happened at least in Kishkun Halash, where uh, returning uh, forced laborers were killed in 1945 or 46. So it happened a couple of times, and I'm sure that there were tensions. Did, did you come across um, about anything about tensions among refugees, Jewish refugees themselves? Um, I mean, in my own research, I've seen tensions among Jewish refugees in Tangier, for instance. Did you, did you see this um, in your research? As far as I could see, I think the Seged Jewish community um, organized it quite efficiently. And they also kept track of what belongs to whom. And I, it seems to me that they had an efficient system on returning items to people uh, that they had belonged to before the war. 
uh, I hope it's not too ideal, idealistic what I'm saying. I haven't come across um, across these papers saying that, oh no, I mean, this rug used to belong to me and you cannot return turn it to them. So I haven't met, I haven't found any, this kind of uh, document in the Seged Jewish archive. Um, and um, I mean, something that you mentioned that I found fascinating because I never came across that before is the laundry service provided by GDC uh, after the war. That, that was really uh, fascinating. It's, it's very new to me. Um, and um, it's, it's a fascinating detail. Um, we, we have a number of other questions. Um, uh, how do you, I, I'm not sure whether you would know those, those specifics, but I will, I will try them anyway. Um, how did American G GDC representatives manage um, to reach Seged in 1944 already? Uh, they had a headquarter in Bucharest. Bucharest and uh, Bucharest, uh, it's not so uh, close to Seged, but I guess they could approach Seged uh, through Romania. And again, we have another question um, about GDC workers in Hungary. Um, if you know the names of some of them, um, someone, someone is asking if you know the names of any specific GDC workers in Hungary at the time. Uh, I have come across this information too. In Seged, it was two gentlemen, the names of whom started with B, and I fortunately, I cannot remember them. And I'm pretty sure that they were not Jews, but I can look after this uh, specific information because it was in one of the, the articles. And then at one point I deleted it because I thought it's not relevant, but we do have this information. Um, and uh, another question about um, the aid provided by JDC to the community in Seged after the war um, is whether, I mean, based on, on what you, you've, um, you've found, um, did JDC provide kosher food after 1945? Uh, was kosher food available in those days at all? Um, and also did JDC um, uh, cater to the religious needs of the survivors uh, with Torah scroll, uh, matzah for Passover, mm -hmm. uh, etc. Okay, as for the second part of the question, uh, I haven't come across any documents that would that would indicate that there was religious life. It doesn't mean that it didn't exist. I just didn't come across any of these documents. Of course, this is something that I can look after in detail. And as for the first part, I'm pretty sure it, the answer is no, because I have seen all kinds of um, lists of foods to be ordered. And on almost all of them, top number one was bacon. So I wonder if, uh, there was kosher food and also I mean the majority of uh, Seged Jews was neolog um, so there was no presence of orthodox Jewry in Seged after the war and to me it seems very much that the food that they have received was everything but kosher. Interesting. Um and uh, I, I mean, we have many more questions and I think we have just the, the time for one or two. Um, uh, I mean, there are a few questions about, oh, this is, um, this is a question that, that, that I would ask you. Um, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I'm a historian working on the Holocaust in Norway, focusing on the economic aspects uh, you said that the furniture was stored in the synagogue and that the valuables were taken away. Um, could you say a little bit more about that? Um, I, I was not really able to connect these two uh, aspects. I do think that the furniture was put down in the synagogue when the Jewish people had to move in the ghetto and the ghetto was around uh, was around the synagogue at that area around uh, the synagogue. So they left their belongings there also in the synagogue garden, which was designed by 
uh, Emmanuel Louvre very precisely. It's one of the only existing synagogue gardens. Uh, so they left their furniture there and uh, at that, at, I, I have, um, I have mentioned the body search that the jury had to go through. So obviously all what was considered valuable, gold, jewelry uh, was taken away. And they made sure that that's why there was the body search. They, they made sure that they cannot take any of their uh, valuables with themselves. And they have also taken a long list of all the paintings saying that this belonged to this person and a list of paintings. So I think these two groups of items were handled in a different way. Um, and um, there, there are some questions. Um, one question has to do uh, where and how will the information you are researching be available to people who are researching their families? Sorry, can you repeat this one? Where and how? Will the information you are researching be available to people who are researching their families? Uh, I imagine this, like, do you plan on publishing, or um, I suppose this is what this question is really about. Yeah, I mean, yes, we are we are publishing, and if someone else is interested in their family histories or all kinds of documents, it's accessible on segejewisharchives.org. Great, because I think we have we have a few questions around that. Um, great, um, Dora, thank you, thank you very much. Um, this was really a very interesting uh, lecture. Um, thank you also to uh, Ruth Masher for uh, introducing you and uh, for the participants uh, for joining us today. Um, our next webinar will take place on May 13. Alexandra Kramen, who received um, the Fred and Ellen. Um, Lewis JDC Archives Fellowship um, will give a lecture on the struggle for Holocaust justice in the Jewish displaced persons community of foreign world 1945-1957. Uh, um, you can register for the program via our JDC Archives um, Facebook page. Um, we hope that many of you will again join us for that program and please um, sign up for our e-newsletter if you would like to be added to our mailing list for public programs. Thank you.